Let's look now at the evidence on industrial policy, and again, by industrial policy, I mean deliberate governmental attempts to pick winners at the level of either an industry or a business firm, of course, toward the end of achieving economic growth. It's a little hard to investigate industrial policy empirically in the cross-country sense, because the concept is hard to measure, it's applied different ways in different areas, but we do see from the numbers some general regularities. And the first of those is that protection, namely protection of trade, does not on average help economic growth, and it may even hurt economic growth. This does not discriminate against all forms of industrial policy, but basically tariffs do not seem to be good for growth. The second point that we see in broader data sets is that having a larger share of an economy devoted to international trade does help growth. So forms of industrial policy which are likely to succeed typically will be those forms which, in some way or another, get the economy more involved in international trade. Finally, industrial policy in isolation doesn't seem to work. In the cases where you do find some successful results, it's generally combined with a strong record in education, flexible markets and fairly flexible labor markets, and having good infrastructure. So it's a little hard to judge industrial policy in the abstract. It depends upon what else is being done in an economy. At the anecdotal level, if we look around the world, it seems that industrial policy has failed in more economies than it has succeeded. For instance, in sub-Saharan Africa, various forms of industrial policy were tried after World War II and the departure of the colonial powers, but most of them didn't go very well. The same can be said for North Africa and a lot of countries in the Middle East. If we turn our attention to Latin America, there the best that could be said for industrial policy is probably that a set of policies called import substitution may have worked fairly well in the 1950s and 60s, but after that they stopped working. We'll have an entire video on that under the heading of import substitution. Maybe it's not completely fair to consider the formerly communist nations in Eastern Europe as examples of industrial policy, but they did, in a literal sense, fit that definition. And again, there you see a fair number of extreme failures. The industrial policies of India following World War II, again, generally did not deliver good results. They were very much hampered by corruption, and India had subpar growth in a lot of these years. The Indian reforms of the 1990s, which are generally considered to be a success, you can think of as a kind of anti-industrial policy or reverse industrial policy, because a lot of the trade protections and subsidies and policies trying to favor particular firms and sectors were pulled away, and this seemed to be good for India. The main success stories for industrial policy come in East Asia. This slide here, which I think you've seen before as the opening slide for our video units, this is actually a picture of South Korea, and there's a lot of evidence that industrial policy helped the South Korean economy grow. Taiwan and Singapore also can be cited of examples of successful Asian industrial policies. China is a little harder to judge, because there you have at the same time a move toward a lot of industrial policy, but also some quite extreme liberalizations. The Chinese economy did extremely well, but it's hard to separate out how much was due to the industrial policy and how much was due to the liberalizations. One argument you can make for China is simply that some of the industrial policies in the short run created a larger class of businessmen more quickly than would have otherwise been the case, and that in fact helped China pursue and maintain further liberalizations. If you look at the case of Japan, that's often cited as an example of successful industrial policy, but that description may be somewhat exaggerated. For instance, their electronics and automobile sectors were not so much encouraged by their bureaucracies in the beginning. And if you look at online budget subsidies in Japan in the period 1955 to 1980, which was the peak of their interest in industrial policy, well, 80% of those subsidies went to agriculture, forestry, and fisheries. Japan, it's not so clear if it really is an example of industrial policy making a big difference. Still, overall, it's fair to say that the successful examples of an industrial policy do generally come in East Asia. When industrial policy does seem to work, what can we attribute this to? Those East Asian economies at the same time had very strong investments in education and training. So all of a sudden they had high-skilled labor forces 
who were looking to export goods and services to the rest of the world. At the same time, those laborers arguably were quite undervalued in terms of their wages. So you can think of the East Asian governments and business firms as playing with, allocating, investing these quite undervalued resources. So a lot of different things they might have done with those resources were going to, be, to pay off because wages were very low, but potential productivity was fairly high. Also, industrial policy will do best when you have a class of bureaucrats who genuinely seem to be interested in the general welfare of the public. That's not something you can take for granted, but arguably it was the case in a number of these East Asian economies. For an overall look at the evidence on industrial policy, I would recommend starting with this piece by Harrison and Rodriguez Clare. It surveys the systematic evidence in great detail. If you'd like to read more about successes of industrial policy, there's a long but very good book by Robert Wade called Governing the Market, which focuses on East Asia. And in general, industrial policy covers a lot of different topics. So look at or relook at our videos on economic growth, international trade, anything covering the idea of increasing returns, and see also our section on India for an in-depth look at why industrial policy often fails, especially when it's confronted with extreme levels of corruption.